I remember my first teacher. I said, oh, I'm not an actor. I just went to observe your class. They told me to come and observe. And she goes, oh, no, you're in the class. And like, you get up there to read. And I said, I don't know how to do that. And so I read. And she goes, oh, my God. You're right. I couldn't tell the difference between you and the chair. And I- <laughs> so the girl next to me thought I was pretty. And I was so embarrassed. But that teacher <laughs> challenged me. Within two years, I became her best pupil in New York. And so I did it. So I have those challenges, those parts of me that I had to do something because I left home, you know, I left Australia, um, having to prove to my parents that there was something beyond being a Greek boy in Sydney. And uh, Mm -hmm. they were very... Because in, in, in the immigration, I was an immigration official, they all thought that was wonderful and, you know, steady and meeting with people, picking me up at five in the morning in the private car and taking me to the launch and meeting with immigrants who were coming in by ship. And and that, it was wonderful. I enjoyed that job, but I just got tired of the racism. I got tired, I'm of, sure. tired of those, in those days, still around. Uh, tired of those days uh, where they they looked at life and uh, thought that it was their country because they were white. And um, who are these foreigners coming in? Well, you know, I I just find that racism is in all of us. It's a matter of how to learn. It's educational. It's how you learn. It's education, yeah, traveling. Like you, you know, seeing the world. It's ugly. It's ugly. I find it's very ugly. It's it's interesting to, um, you know, I've listened to several of your interviews. You're very humble about your, about your life. And I, I'm fascinated. The most fascinating thing I, 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 about you in my humble opinion is that you're very, very, you're very educated. You're very self-educated and you're, and you talk a lot about your interior and, um, which is the most important part of you. And that's such a, it's such a needed message in the world today. For people, because you know, we all get lucky if we're born and we're healthy enough, and we get our genes, whatever we get, and we're lucky if some of them look better than others. But the truth is that we didn't get that on our own, but we get our our interior study on our own, and you know who we are, our spirit, to yeah, recognize what, that. Yeah, but why are we here? You know, why did mm. now that I've kind of seen the whole arc of my life at this stage Mm -hmm. um i can be a little more solid on it you know it's about becoming and then one day you wake up and you become and then people find out they don't like what they've become or they're not satisfied time is against them they didn't really do the things they wanted to do out of fear or maybe finances or whatever but you know there's a solution to everything it doesn't mean that you're going to love the solution, but at least you you put it out there to give it a try. And I mean, I wanted to be an archaeologist, but I just saw how many years it was going to take, and I, I needed to support myself and and stayed with daytime, which in many ways, I remember Gloria Monty from General Hospital said, "Get out of this daytime. You've got <laughs> too many good things about you to explore." And she goes, "What? Don't waste it here." And I think um, I think it was rescuing my parents. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want, and we're supposed to go beyond them. I didn't want it. I didn't want mm-hmm. them to suffer anymore. I wanted to give them something they hadn't had. And I think their greatest wish was to be able to go back to Greece. Was so, it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I sent them back six times. And... Mm-hmm. And so it gave their last renaissance that gave it purpose. And um, and then I said to my sister, well, listen, take him to, to Italy. Here are the mm-hmm. tickets. I'll get you the tickets and, and take him to Italy. Now, she goes, I just want to go to Rhodes. I said, that's all you do. You go Sydney Rhodes, Sydney Rhodes. And I said, <laughs> what do you learn from that? It's just seeing relatives. You don't want to explore. I see how that has affected her today, the lack of exploration and not knowing herself. And so that uh, once her husband died, she was kind of left alone because 
So my brother and I talk about it. He's been fortunate because he's had a successful teaching career, so has his wife. I call her the heiress because she's inherited a lot of money. But my sister is on her own. And uh -huh. the one thing I did come full circle was that I, I rescued my parents. I took care of them all the years. But when they died, mm. I, I suddenly realized I hadn't done it for myself. So when I was, because they both died in the same week, so that was really tough. So when I'm oh, sitting at the funeral and everybody left and I'm sitting mm. there and I'm thinking, what am I going to do now? Suddenly acting became stupid. Suddenly the, mm. the idea of acting was I was doing it for my family. And so then I thought, so I didn't work, wasn't interested in working for another three years. I sat up in my hill and traveled and came back and couldn't get over the fact that death, when it happens to you, it, it's not, mm. it's different for everybody, but in many ways it's, you can't comprehend it until it happens. That loss, that that empty thing that happens to you. And so I had to reinvent my dream. And that was not easy. Um, but it's now, I'm at a point now where I'm thinking, when do I retire? And but this podcast has given me what's interesting is yeah. I haven't done this before. It's 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 a natural for you with your voice and your storytelling, and your your travel, and your you know historical. It's a natural for you. I love it. Uh, lost treasures. Hmm. I, it's wonderful. It, did your third one come out today, Tyle? Coming out at three o'clock. Oh, good. Your time. Yeah, uh, three o'clock my time. My agent called me and he said, "I need a little synopsis." I said, "I already put it up." And the idea is um, a modern man walking the ancient road. Mm -hmm. And it kind of shows a lot of different things. I've got to pitch something of it next week because I think it's got legs. Mm. Uh, movie uh, legs? Movie legs, Tyle, to make a movie? There's a series, I think. A series, uh huh. I'm, I'm all right, already writing the script. I writ, wrote the script, uh, and then it was it. It's a period piece, and then of course, do they like period pieces? Well, it depends on who's going. But these young people today, who want things simplified, not too much dialogue, it, they just they don't have the you know the 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 world of TikTok. And yeah, so, it's a shame, you know, isn't it? Yeah, and what they think is right. And then I want to say to them, do you realize how many bad movies we have? Yeah. Do you realize how many bad series we have? It's because you people didn't come out of the golden age. I came out of a golden age at the end of it, and I got to see who and how these incredible artists from England and America and Europe what they did and how well they did. I mean, Scorsese is such a an example. Yeah. Spielberg, they you know they they're part of even Francis Ford Coppola with his new film. I I don't understand these young people, and so they read the script. They love the idea. I think it's mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, I have a young man going through it and and exploring the story. And coming across it, and 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 flashing back to that all that. Oh, I like that. And, yeah, but making it modern and then flashing back. I, is that what you're going? I like yeah, that idea. They only, they only want no more than three flashbacks. They want the well, story to be more about him. Well, the character is really about my life and how I got. Yeah, of course. You're the modern man walking back through history, right? Why aren't yeah. you going to, you should, be, you, it should be you. Why don't you do it? Why don't you be the lead character and, you know, be your, have uh, it be yeah. your Indi Indiana well, Jones, you know? I'd like Michael Fassbender to play Schliemann. Michael Fassbender. I like how you say his name. <laughs> <laughs> he would. <laughs> He would be a good Schleeman. Yeah, he's cool. Yeah, he Michael Fassbender should play him. You're yes, so funny. 
it's uh, it's uh, German. Yeah, it's yeah, German. right. German. So you're a purist. You're a purist. So you're going because you you don't see him. You can you couldn't play it because you know his character and it's so close to your heart. I'm too old to play his character. Oh, so you're not too old. It's it's you would have to write a different story. You would have yes. to. Have, well, you, you know, know, let's face it. He was 67 Schliemann when he when he died um, in the gutter. Which was so sad, but um, I'd like, and then for the young Sophia is his wife, um, Vikanda. You know, um, she's a she looks very young. She's in her early thirties, but she's got that wonderful, innocent face, beautiful face. And I thought those two together it would be an interesting. So that's where I'm pitching it. That's where you're pitching. Uh, yes. but but the, the thing on. Um, the story that I that I want to do for myself in these podcasts is to take an audience. I mean, I've had so many uh, women, especially, say to me, "Have you ever thought about taking a group of us together on a journey?" That would be. I'm so sure you've had many women ask you that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I've already not your uh, not your first rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> So, <laughs> right. uh, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. I had to. No, no, I no. thought it was funny. I'm sorry. No, no, <laughs> it was, but uh, like I had my friend Daphne in Athens who said, "You know, who else could I go to Egypt with? I wouldn't know. I wouldn't trust anyone else. I couldn't go with another woman. I need a man to be with me, and you know it." And and then, well, that's true. I can. She has a good point. You know, yeah, I wouldn't recommend a woman to go to the Middle East by the way. No, I di- I did go to the Middle East uh, by myself. I was I uh, and I was chased. I was chased, and a, and a man saved me. A sheik, a man in a cab, saved my life. And I was all bundled up too. It's not Where like was I it? looked. Where was it at? Eight, eight years ago, I went to Bahrain, and uh, I was invited to do some of my research. I do research on mentoring uh, in oh. my my doctor program, and so. I'm not that smart. That sounds like I'm super smart. I'm just, I'm not, I'm just curious. That's all. But anyway, right. here I am. I'm like, oh my God, my father, my daddy told me you should not go to Bahrain by yourself. I said, daddy, I'll be fine. You know, of course, what happens? I nearly, I literally could have been trapped there. This sheik came rushing out of the cab and started yelling at this man who was chasing me. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. And I'm like, get me in the cab. Just let me in the cab. And he rushed me. And he was going to go kill this guy because in Bahrain, he told me it was legal if they were trying to murder or rape a woman that they could he could have killed him and not had any consequences. So it was terrifying for me. It was my last day there too. I thought I was oh, I thought I got out of it scot free, but I didn't. So I would agree with I would agree with your friend. Don't go to don't go there by yourself. Yeah, even so when you're all bundled I've got, up. I've got my friend Lisa who I went uh, in 2019. I took her and her husband who was my producer from Mission Impossible. And mm. I took him there. And um, it was such a fascinating story. Um, I have a friend who's a wonderful psychic who said to her, when you go to Egypt, you're going to come into a room where this goddess, this lion goddess is in the room and you have to touch her for your blessing. It's oh. very important you do this. And we went, oh, okay. While we were at Karnak Temple in Luxor, we had this big, big guy as our guide. And my producer said to me, uh, Jeff said, you know, we don't need him any further. I said, no, I think we do. Let's just do it one more day with him. I said, he knows his knowledge. He's very nice. Um, and he says, okay. So the next day when we went, he said to me, because you people have been so nice to me, I'm going to give you a very special Uh. experience. And we said, oh, what's that? So he took us behind the Karnak temple and in this locked little kind of cottage, he got the police to open it for us because it was sacred. Wow. And when he opened it and we walked in, there is the statue. Mm. It's all standing by itself, beautifully lit. Oh. And a partition couldn't grow. Mm. 
What was Gorgeous. interesting is they said, my psychic friend said, you must touch her breast. She goes, well, how am I going to touch the breast? You know, you're not allowed to touch. No, you will. Something will happen. You will. And I remember the guards opened the partition. He says, you may go and touch her. Mm. Like it was, and my producer looked at me and went, if we had gotten rid of him yesterday, that wouldn't have happened today. And the fact that the guy, well, you're not supposed to touch a statue, opens it up for her to go and touch. And she went and touched. And it, it was, for her, it was extraordinarily uh, profound. But when we came out, um, he, he said to me, this is probably, I've done a lot of journeys in my life, but this is the greatest journey I've ever had. And it's uh -huh. all because I knew where to take them, even to um, uh, in an area in Samanu, the Holy Family hid from Herod, and the and the Virgin Mary appeared there for a year in 1967. I've heard and of that. He, you know, it's incredible. And uh -huh. uh, we took them there. But when we came back, he got ill, and a year later, he died. Mm -hmm. And his wife and I were ha having dinner the other night here at my home. I had talked to him. She said, my, my God, I will never get over that Jeffrey thought that that was the greatest journey he'd ever had, and that was the end of his life. That's beautiful. Who knew at 60, he was in his 60s. Who Six knew? Five. He was going to die. I mean, I still can't get over that he's gone. Um, mm. I mean, he's not a person who liked actors a lot, but I hit it off with him. I didn't know why at first until we traveled. And he said to me, you know, I love I, I loved being in your company because you, you, you've got style, man. You have style. And he was you do. A he's, he's a bit of a snob. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So all the years of training with all the years that I did with all these different people who were my mentors and teachers, I things rubbed off. I mean, spending time with Gilgood, spending time with Harold Prince, spending time with, with Stephen Sondheim, spending uh -huh. time with Jacqueline Kennedy. All these people were all part of where my spirit was nourished and so you must be you must be I, can i can i interrupt just one for one say one thing uh, just listen to speak you know having had you have had a remarkable journey and i hope it's much much longer i'm sure it will be um mm. but you have a certain um how to put my finger on it it's a you're almost a spiritual teacher if not are a spiritual teacher and i think that's why in my once again my humble estimation uh, i think that's probably why you're put um as a as an emmy award winning actor on for 40 years on daytime television and and in you know being able to travel the world because i think that's what your who your soul is i don't think people get the opportunity um to do what you've done so far in your life had you not been a very old soul and understand um, that you're born to teach and that you were given your, the gift of how you look in your physicality because you are a teacher and you're here to spread a message that um, it's not about, famous is not about uh, just being pretty or just being a fabulous actor. It's about um, looking in people's hearts and spreading a good positive message because that's what I hear. I've been because you're coming to our film festival. Thank you so much. I'm so mm -hmm. excited for it, and so is everyone. You're a guest of honor. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, I mean, but that, I think that's who you are. That's my. That's what I see when I when I well, see. I did you. twelve years with the spiritual counselor mm -hmm. uh, because I was confused about where I was going. Yeah, and I remember when I walked in, she said, "How dare you come here?" with the mind you have and the trash you associate with. That was her opening. Uh, and I went, oh, I don't think I need to be here. So I turned around <laughs> and left. <laughs> and six months later, I went in and she said, are you ready? And I said, yes. I spent three days a week with her for 12 years. And... Towards the end, she looked up at me and she goes, 
Oh my God, you have no idea the blessing that is above you. Mm. I said, no, I can't tell you what it is, but if you knew, you would not believe it. It's I've not seen this before, but mm. so in many ways, I, I I'm a, an eleventh hour Harry. I get rescued. Mm. There's problems, you know, the kidnapping in Egypt, the yeah. throwing me against the wall, thinking I was an Israeli spy. Um, the trouble is, you know, finally I think to myself, all oh, this knowledge, where do you put it? Well, I've, I've written a couple of books, but I need mm -hmm. to reach out an audience. And when I saw those students today, I thought, look at the way they're listening. They're just taking it in because it's not a boring story. You have to know how to tell the story. Right. You know, and you have to listen to the listener to make sure that you have them. And so, you know, one of the things Obama did very well is that when he would throw out a sentence that was profound, he allowed it to land. And once it did, and people went, oh, he went on to the next. But he knew how orators are very important. And the one thing I found out about the ancient orators during an illiterate age in Greece in the 8th century BC was that they used to go into, like, clubs where a man would come in and play an instrument and and have these men and remind them that they're walking the earth that previously to them, gods of men also walked. Yes. That, you know, so imagine, so it's it's about the wordage. You know, you have to you have to give images. And I think it's important that like someone says to me, Oh, what are you gonna talk about that? I say I have no idea, I've got to watch the audience. Once I see the audience, I, I somehow sense them. And then mm -hmm. I go, something comes out, and then it becomes your story. It's yeah. your, you're very intuitive. You're a psychic. You're psychic yourself. I think, I mean, everyone has intuition, but some people are, it's just like some people, we can all jump a little if we can jump, but some people can really jump. And, you know, so you so have tell me about of yourself. Tell me about yourself. Why, why are you there? Well, I was, I was born in a little, um, tiny, uh, part of the world with six brothers on a farm uh, yeah. and um, six generations, farmer's daughters um, oh. in Northeast Iowa, born in Minnesota, raised in Iowa. And um, I was just, I was, I I almost uh, died when I was like three. I fell in a cow tank because I was always a curious girl and I nearly, I, I nearly died. I saw the other side. And so in my lifetime, I never questioned that there was another side because I already saw it my entire life. And I woke up talking about it to my mother and uh, I was literally gone. And uh, and then I would tell people my whole life what I would see because I would have dreams and um, sometimes they would come true. And I would tell my mother, she t said to me, honey, you can't tell anyone that. You don't, don't tell people what you dream, but they'll think you're strange. Um, I said, okay. But so I was always a little, I was always a little, uh, interested in in everyone else's stories because i believe that we are indeed all born to un un uncover what we are here to do and mm. uh i was a, i was always uh, an artist and a writer but i'm most interested in putting other people's stories i'm most interested in having people talk about their truth like you're giving me the chance lucky enough to talk to you about it because it's fascinating to me um and it's personal and everybody has their story. My company is called Sacred Noise Society. It's my producing company. And say, our sacred noise to me is our, our internal sacred voice that we all have. Um, and it doesn't matter who we are. We all have it. We either listen to it or we don't. So that's my job in life. And so that's why I do art and film festivals and sing and dance. And But I'm more interested in other people's stories now because I already know my story. You're far more interesting to talk to than me talk about myself i'm not that special i i like i said i'm just a little i'm from no one ever 
ever told me I could ever be, uh, you know, got to do what I do in my life because I'm born in, in the middle of nowhere in a t- tiny little town. So I did art not to be famous, um, but I did it to be good at it. You know, that's that's how we, that's how I was raised. I went to college and I've always, I've done lots of theater and just did a feature film. But I have a asthma with you. He was so one. I loved him so much. I miss him to this day. He was going to be um, play my father in my feature film that I just did called Painting Jane, but we lost him right right before we started shooting. But he was just he was so remarkable. He was such he was so ordinary and so genuine. And he, he and he and he he told me I reminded him of his daughter. He has got a daughter named Katie as well. And I put his uh, his uh, his daughter Liza in my movie and plays my sister. Oh. But he was just we had the best time. He came back twice, you know, to the festival. And so uh, he would have come back again, but you know, he was in heaven. He was. It was just. It was just. Hmm? Was he in New York? Is he, he was from in New LA. York? In he's, LA. he's actually. He's actually from Kansas. Ed's from Kansas. Hmm. The son of a junk man. He was. He was. So, he worked his entire life, and he was president of SAG uh, after for eight yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, but he no, was wonderful. A long, long time. He was friends of friends of mine. You would he, love it, she thought. You, you, you would love because you're very extremely intelligent, and, and so is he. You know, he was he was a man's man. He was a he was a very, you know, a humble, sweet. Came to our little part of the world. I gave grounded. him an edit. Hmm? Grounded, very grounded. You know, it's interesting to see. Like some of these producers that I've worked with, there's a GH producer, Paul Valentini, who's such a prissy son of a bitch. And mm-hmm. and I always thought best way to deal with that kind of an empty ego is to ignore it. And it made him curious to the point where he used to come and want to know what's going on with me and how are you? Are you <laughs> yourself? And I said, yes. But I'm studying my lines right now. I wouldn't give them the time of day, and then you, you have and and the backstabbers, and then you have the one that we had on Days of Our Lives, and he used to be a director, then became the executive producer, who also added being a director, who also added being a writer. So he was being a bit of a glutton, and he just got fired this year because women had reported him, and you know, the Me Too movement. Um, but he was a terrible liar. He invite me to his house, telling me that I was going to become head of the family. Never happened. And then uh-huh. you have the head writer comes to me and says, oh, man, you're, you're just too deep. He says, I don't know how to write for you. I said, do you know how long it took to get deep? Yeah, right. So you have these, these people in charge, and then you realize why the medium is failing yeah because it needs to be people. saved it needs to be saved so they, it's they broken involve people and you know this it's these stories are shallow and that's why you know it's interesting why you resonate with people and why you don't right. and part of that is people get like intimidated if you're too evolved or had so much to go on with in life and they, they don't know how to handle it but i noticed the actors that remain these days i mean i've been doing days 41 years uh yeah. they're just so shallow i cannot believe they don't know what's going on uh all there are it's more and more it's become such a narcissistic society that they don't know how to share stories or if you do share you see the envy you see them not wanting it for you and i haven't had except for the actresses who both actors who played my wife who have uh, um, listened to my podcast but the others haven't even acknowledged it on social media it's been out there and not one of them would even you know call me or whatever uh when i was nominated for my last emmy i got 2020 right 2020 what didn't uh, you 2020 yes i mean People were like, I thought. So I went to my producer and I said, you know, something's missing. Because what, 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 what? 
I said, I, I, I was nominated this past year. I didn't even hear a word from any of you. I know you're all used to it because you're only in a category with four shows. We're in a category with hundreds of actors. Hundreds of actors. That's correct. Right. So it's still important to us. We yeah. still feel we've achieved something. But they mm -hmm. don't because the next day, you know, like any award show, people forget who won last night. And that's the kind of attitude. So we need to remind people of the important factors and why things in life fade away and how we lose them mm -hmm. because we're not feeding them. And so an actor needs to be encouraged. A writer needs to be encouraged. But yeah. people are just about themselves. Once they finish what they're doing, they go. And so... Um, I don't. It's not I'm very place. sentimental. You know. You know. I don't. I don't like the filmmakers in the Star City Film Festival. I like to keep keep them. And if they put their independent film in this festival that I started, I want them to do it again. And I don't charge them a fee to come in. And I don't, because this is my way to give back because it's so uninteresting not to give back to the world. And people forget when you give back, you give so much, you get so much more. You get Absolutely. so much more. It's called investment. Yeah, because it means something. It's not phony. It's like you create um, community and you, you know, and like there's nothing more wonderful than, as you know, better than anybody because you've been in the business so long and so good at it and just keep showing up and keep being better than you were before, you know, that's, that's remarkable. That takes so much work. I mean, it's, it's not just, you're just, you're not just lucky. You just, you work. And luck, you has work. Nothing to, luck has nothing to do with it. No. I think it's about being prepared. When something comes along, you're ready for it. I've always wondered how you could do. I mean, as an actor, I know how, what it takes to be on stage and memorize that many, many lines. Right. And I've done it a number of times. But to do it every day and a, in a soap opera and to show up and to be present and to be, you know, I think it's one of the hardest gigs ever as an actor. I've always deeply admired the yeah, I, mean, I, still, I still dress myself. I mean, I do my own costumes. Every That's day. amazing. The order master knows. I just said to him, okay, the day before, I see what this scene's about. So I, I need this kind of coloring and this suit and whatever. And You're uh, very stylish. You you know how to do that. That's your thing. Well, yeah, <laughs> I think because I did fashion in my 20s and I did it with uh, Melodandre. I mean, I did all those actors and um filmmakers uh so i was tested you know as far as my taste was concerned even jack nicholson oh wow you know, and john gilgood and lillian gish and robert redford i mean i think of all those people uh that i dressed and even told redford he's he needed to lose his love handles i heard this yeah that's <laughs> That was kind of <laughs> like, oh my God, how did I ever say that to him and get away with it? But, you know, it was so innocent that he couldn't stop laughing after I did it. And and to think all those years later, um, he remembered me 10 years later. In a and that's when you were working in New York. Yeah, you were yeah, working in New York and as a, in a town. Amazing. Uh, Mama Andre was the exclusive. I mean, you know, the person who I followed in was Ralph Lauren. Wow. Ralph Lauren was working with Roland and they were mm -hmm. going to expand together, but they somehow didn't quite get along. So Ralph Lauren went on his own and I came in and then my boss liked me a lot and you know why he liked me a lot? Because wow. he tested all all the people who worked for him. He put them for a week at the money register. And whoever <laughs> came out with the exact <laughs> penny was the most honest. Oh. The person he could trust. And so mine was to the penny. Uh -huh. And, you know, I, the one thing I've never done in my life is be a cheat. And so... You know, it wasn't my money, it was that person's money. And, and I was very proud to do it. 
And then he said to me, I'm going to open a shop in Washington. I think you would know how to talk to those politicians. I know you can convince them about how they should wear a suit. And I said, oh. And he said, and the shop will be ready next year. But I suddenly someone said to me, no, you should be an actor. And when I told him, he broke the coat hanger, I remember. He was so furious that I would leave. How could you leave? And I went, well, I want to be an actor. I'm gonna, I can't make money here, really. He says, you'll make a lot of money. You know, I'll give you great commissions. And so I went with the acting, and he, nobody makes money in acting unless the 1%, right? And so I went into the acting, and I spent the next five years working um, as an assistant to Milton Katselis, and then it started to hit. And when it did hit, I was leaving for London to become a Shakespeare actor. I wanted ah. to go there. And as soon as I made that move, the jobs came. The mm. theatres came. Ken mm. Russell came. Um, the Amundsen. Uh, 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 Charlton Heston. Vanessa Redgrave. I mean, suddenly I went, "Oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend time with some wonderful people," and yeah. that's what happened. So, and then of course, three years later, Roland died of a heart attack in Central Park. So I made the right decision. Mm -hmm. If I'd stayed with him, it would have collapsed. But his little boy, Roland's mm -hmm. little boy, is now head of of animation at Fox. Wonderful. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Nice.